tonight I'm going to give your brains a break. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to share with you my testimony. So you can actually relax. You don't have to think very hard. You could just sit back and listen. Well, sort of. Because we are going to get a little bit into the Bible. And you are going to have to think a little bit. <laughs> but um, I want to share with you how the Lord... Uh, called me, and um, so I, I, I've entitled my sermon, <coughs> <coughs> my testimony actually, um, I've got a couple of different titles for it, but tonight we're calling it The Avenger of Blood. Amen. The Avenger of Blood. I know, I know. Like, Pastor, how do you come up with these titles? I know. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless us as we... Um, as we hear a word from you, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 By the way, is it okay if I preach in my jacket? I'm just, I'm cold. I wanted to come up here in my hat, but because uh, my head is kind of cold too, but, you know. Are you sure? I don't know. I feel funny about preaching in a hat. Oh, man. Uh. <laughs> Put it on backwards. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Backwards is just too much, so we're just going to... Is this okay? Yes. Okay. I've never done this before, ever, ever. All right, well, but we're in Australia, so... Okay. Just please, nobody come talk to me afterward. Don't bring me a spirit of prophecy quote, please. There's no spirit of prophecy quote that talks about hats, okay? I don't think. I don't think. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, where, where am I? Um, the Avenger of Blood. The Avenger of Blood. Uh, okay, so we are going to meet a fictional person tonight, but the story is a real story. <clears throat> At least um, the, the dimensions of the story uh, is, is real. But I'm going to give you a fictional character and a fictional story. But you'll get the point as we get into it. I want you to meet Jael. Jael uh, lives in Canaan. He is one of the people who made it out of the wilderness as a young child. And now he has uh, settled in Canaan. He's got a family, beautiful wife children, and yes, they can't see my face, oh my, Can you just give me a couple moments, please? I'm just <laughs> really struggling with this. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, so, um, <laughs> this is going on Facebook. Oh boy. Don't put this on Facebook. Okay. <clears throat> yes. A beanie? Let's, let's try the beanie. Yeah. <laughs> this is a brown beanie, and it doesn't look cool. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> okay, let's try this. Is this on camera? Is this, is this being recorded? 
Oh, my goodness. Is that okay? <laughs> Getting all kinds of hats thrown up here. <laughs> okay, sorry, I didn't mean to offend the, the hat of <clears throat> the person up there. Uh, I want to start over. <laughs> okay, yes, Heavenly Father, please. Uh, be with us, Lord, as we, as we uh, hear a word from you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, Jael uh, has a family, wife, children, and he has a good job. One day, something happens. The unthinkable. Jael is working. <clears throat> and as he's working, a freak accident happens. Jael has accidentally killed a man. He knows what must happen. He runs home and he begins to tell his wife what has happened. His wife and his children immediately begin to weep because they know what's coming next. They know that Jael must run to what is called a city of refuge. City of Refuge. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 19. Deuteronomy chapter 19. Deuteronomy 19, beginning <coughs> with verse 1. The Bible says here, When the Lord thy God has cut off the nations whose land the Lord thy God giveth thee, and thou succeedest them, and dwelleth in their cities and in their houses, thou shalt separate three, three cities for thee in the midst of thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it. Thou shalt prepare thee a way, and divide the coasts of thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to inherit, into three parts, that every slayer may flee thither. And this is the case of the slayer, which shall flee thither, that he may live. Whosoever killeth his neighbor ignorantly, whom he hated not in time past, as when a man goeth into the wood with his neighbor to hew wood, and his hand fetcheth a stroke with the axe to cut down the tree, and the head slippeth from the helve and lighteth upon his neighbor, that he die, he shall flee unto one of those cities and live, lest the avenger of blood pursue the slayer, while his heart is hot, and overtake him because the way is long, and slay him, whereas he was not worthy of death, inasmuch as he hated him not in time past. Wherefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt separate three cities for thee. The Bible lays out this, this rule that if someone killed another man ignorantly by accident, he was to flee to one of these cities of refuge. Now, the Bible says here that there were three cities of refuge, but an additional three cities were later added. So there were a total of six cities of refuge uh, uh, listed in the book of Joshua. And the person who accidentally killed someone was to run to that city. Why? Lest the avenger of blood pursue him. How many of you are familiar with this concept? The, the avenger of blood, the Hebrew word for avenger of blood is the word gael, and it means nearest of kin. So, so the nearest of kin had permission, in essence, to seek vengeance for the person that had killed his family member. So, so I want you to imagine what it would have been like for Jael to have killed this man accidentally and then be going to, you know, maybe going to the market one day and someone comes up to him and says simply, hey, is your name Jael? And he says, yes, that's me. And he just pulls out a knife and puts it in his chest. That's what the avenger of blood could do. So Jael, think about it, doesn't know who this man's family is, doesn't know who the nearest of kin is. He would be looking over his back at all times. And so you can understand why Jael has to flee to one of these cities of refuge. The Bible says in verse 
3 of Deuteronomy 19, speaking of these cities. It says, thou shalt prepare thee a way and divide the coast of thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to inherit it into three parts that every slayer may flee thither. A way was to be prepared so that the person running for his life could have easy access to these cities of refuge. It is said that signposts were put along the way so that the man or woman running for his or her life did not have to stop to figure out which way to the city of refuge. These signposts <clears throat> were to point the way to these cities of refuge. There were six cities of refuge. There were six cities of refuge. These cities of refuge were all located in elevated places. These were cities on hills. Okay, you're not feeling me. <laughs> These were cities on hills. And the Bible says that a way was to be prepared so that the man or woman running for his life could have access to the cities. Every stone was to be moved out of the way so that the person running for his life would not stumble or trip up and had every opportunity to reach the city <coughs> without the avenger of blood catching him outside the city. Because if the avenger of blood caught him outside the city, the avenger of blood could take his life. So a way was to be prepared. A way was to be prepared. <laughs> A way was to be prepared so that the man running for his life, and by the way, that's the story I'm telling you tonight, how I ran for my life to make it to the city of refuge. Do you realize that when Jesus said, you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill cannot be hid? You see, beloved, God calls us to be those signposts in the way, pointing to the cities of refuge. You are supposed to be a sign that people running for their lives don't have to stop and figure out. <laughs> Did you catch that just now? Like, I praise God for the people, the signposts that God put in my life, the people that he put in my life. When I understood that the avenger, how many of you remember the avenger of blood being on your trail? You remember when you first realized, oh, whoa, I got to run for my life. I've got to make it to that city of refuge, which, by the way, points us to Jesus Christ. The signposts in my life were very clear signs. I didn't have to stop to figure out. I didn't have to stop to try to discern. Beloved, as, as signposts, we need to be giving a clear signal of who we are and where the city of refuge is. <laughs> These cities of refuge point us to an amazing truth. And it is this. The Bible says that God is our refuge. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's good news and it's also bad news. Because you see, if God is our refuge, then that means something must have happened. <clears throat> Did you catch that just now? If God is our refuge, that means something must have happened. Listen, the city of refuge is, is only for people. It's not for liars. It's not for thieves. It's not for, uh, you know, adulterers. It's for people who have killed someone. If God is our refuge, you're like, well, wait a minute. I, I haven't killed anybody. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, think again. Our sins <coughs> put, 
put Jesus on the cross. And God says, if you accidentally kill someone, you can run to the city. Now check this out. When you got to the city, if it was discovered that you did not accidentally kill the person, that it was intentional, you know what happened? They put you out of the city and the avenger of blood could find you outside the city and take your life. So I want you to imagine if God is our, because here's where the parallel breaks down. God is our refuge, amen? amen. Praise God. And, and, and listen, when we come to the city, we have two options. We can plead innocent. I didn't know that I killed the son of God. Or we can plead guilty. If we plead guilty, if we plead innocent, we're liars. God has every right to put us outside the city. And yet we throw ourselves at the mercy of God and plead what? Guilty. And when we plead guilty, guess what? God has every right to put us out of the city. But because we plead guilty, here's where the parallel breaks down. God so loved the world. When we plead guilty, he declares us innocent. It's amazing. I want you to imagine for a moment Jael on the run. He's running for his life, and the avenger of blood is so close to him that he can hear the footsteps of the avenger of blood in the dark. Can you see the picture? He is running for his life, and he hears the footsteps of the avenger behind him. His heart is pounding. He cannot see his face, but he knows if he's caught outside the city, that's it. I'm going to tell you about my run. Because, beloved, in that run, God makes us new creatures. That's what the run is all about. It's about God making us new creatures. And listen, when God makes us new, what, you know, when God makes us new creatures, he is exercising his creative power. That's what he does. You think about it. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. God recreates us. Do you know, do you know that the, the greatest power, the greatest evidence of God's creation, the greatest example of God's creative power is in the, the creation week? Yeah? How does the creation week begin? In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. <clears throat> Do you know that uh, Genesis 1, 1 through 3 describe the condition of every person before they meet Christ? You start out in darkness, without form. Life is empty until the Spirit of God moves and says, let there be light. Yeah. So I'm going to give you day one of my, of my recreation account. I was born in Jamaica. Not that Jamaica is a place of darkness without form and void. <clears throat> but I was born in Jamaica. My parents were not Christians. Um, the extent of their of my religious experience as a child is that they had me christened as a Catholic because they had a friend who was a Catholic priest told them I should be christened. You know, because God burns babies. <laughs> um, <clears throat> my father was in the military. I'm one of four uh, sons. Uh, I am son number three. My younger brother is 11 months younger than, than me. My older brothers are uh, seven years older than me and nine years older than me. And um, 
even though we were not religious and did not go to church, I look back now and see God working in my life, working in our lives without us even knowing him because that's who God is. Um, a couple of examples that I you know, typically share is, uh, for example, when I was uh, a little baby, uh, when I was born, I was a very fair-skinned baby, so I looked like I was white. Yeah, very, very fair-skinned. And, and so um, you're probably wondering, well, Pastor, what does it have to do with anything right now? Uh, my, one day my mom decided to, to go to the beach. She took me to the beach. Uh, we were, she was there with an uncle of mine and a couple of other family members. My father wasn't there, um, but we were all, you know, there at the beach, and I'm in my little baby carriage, and my mom got in the water, and she thought that my uncle was watching me. My uncle got in the water. He thought that my mom was watching me. And so neither of them were watching me, but somebody else was watching me. So my mom's in the water, and something tells her to turn around. And as she turns around, all she sees is my little baby carriage disappearing over the horizon. I was being kidnapped. Fear not, I am here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. Because <laughs> you guys are like, <laughs> were you ever found? I'm, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> so my mom starts screaming. My uncle jumps up, runs, uh, runs after whoever was taking me. He catches the person or the people that were taking me. It was a couple. And they told him they were taking me for a walk. I couldn't walk. <laughs> Here's the kicker. It was a white couple. <laughs> I often wonder what would have happened after they discovered that they grabbed the wrong child. <laughs> after a couple of months, they would have been like, wait, what? <laughs> What happened? You <laughs> yeah. So God was watching over me. God was watching over me. When I was uh, five years old, uh, by the way, my father was in the military. And uh, being in the military in Jamaica uh, would often, you know, be in, in conflict with, like, the local uh, drug lords. And so um, something happened where my father had been gone somewhere. And my, um, uh, my mother, my brothers and I were all home. <coughs> my, <clears throat> my older brother was about to go outside. It was getting to be evening. And as he was about to, to open the front door, he noticed that there were two men on either side of the door and they were armed. So these were people that had come to our home to basically wipe out our family. My neighbors on either side saw what was going on. And uh, this big shootout happened, and by the grace of God, none of us were hurt. And <clears throat> uh, my father, when he returned, said, okay, we're leaving. We left Jamaica and moved to the United States of America uh, to a place called Little Jamaica or Brooklyn, New York. And there in Brooklyn, New York, my younger brother and I were introduced to something called the hip-hop culture. Had never heard of it, had never heard this kind of music. It was just all, we saw kids dressing with beanies. <laughs> uh, you know, it was this whole style of dressing and music and stuff we'd never seen or heard before. And we were totally mesmerized by it. And, uh, and I've got to share with you a couple of reasons um, why this became such an important um, thing in our lives. Uh, when I came from Jamaica, I had a couple of what I thought were disadvantages. So number one, my name was Ivor. Everybody else had normal names. <laughs> <laughs> so the worst day of school for me was usually the first day of school because the principal would, or I'm sorry, the, the teacher would be doing roll call 
And as he's going through the names, Tom, here, Michael, here, Tina, here, and then he gets to my name. And I would just see this. <laughs> and I just begin to sink in my seat like, oh man, here it comes here. And then he would say something like, even, or ever, eagle. And the kids would just start breaking out, laughing at my name. So I hated my name, number one. Number two, when I would open my mouth to speak, because I had a very heavy Jamaican accent, and my older brother likes to tell me that Jamaicans couldn't even understand me because it was that heavy. Patois, if you ever heard of it, very heavy. And so when I would speak, the kids would laugh at me. And so as a result, I developed this intense fear of speaking in front of people. <laughs> if any man be in Christ. <laughs> So the teacher would call me to read my grade and I would stand up in the class and I wouldn't say anything because I knew the kids were going to laugh. And I would literally, my hands, you could see my hands shaking from fear of even speaking in public. Um, so my brother and I found that one of the best ways that we were making friends, that we could make friends was through music. And so we began to get deeper into this hip hop music, break dancing, Kids were spinning on their heads and doing all this kind of stuff we'd never seen before. And we began to, to do those things and began to make friends. My first religious experience came at the age of 12 years old. I, was, uh, I had just met a cousin who had come over from England. Her name's Susan. And <clears throat> first time meeting her, we spent the summer of 1986 together and we immediately hit it off. Um, what we didn't know about Susan, at the time, I think I was like maybe 12 years old, 11 years old, something like that, and Susan was maybe about 14. Um, what my younger brother and I did not know about Susan is that she was a Christian. And um, so, you know, she would talk to us like here and there about the Bible and about religious things, and we'd kind of be like, hmm, okay, because we, remember, we, we never went to church, never went to church, um, not even for Christmas, and I mean, it was just like never. Um, and so one day, my parents were at work, and it's the morning. My brother and I, we're in our pajamas. You know, we're just talking to Susan. And she begins to talk to us about the Bible. But this morning was a little bit different than other, than other times because she began to talk to us about this book called the Book of Revelation. And when you're 12 years old and have never read the Bible before and your parents aren't home, and someone begins to tell you about beasts coming up out of the water <laughs> and other things of that nature, you, it can be a pretty traumatic experience. But then it got worse because she begins to tell us about this thing called the mark of the beast. And, and let, me, let me pause right here and give you a little bit of background. That summer, 1986, a movie, I believe, had just come out about a little boy who was from England <laughs> <clears throat> who discovers that he is the Antichrist. He has the number 666 written in his forehead, and anyone that discovers his identity dies a mysterious, heinous, super long, drawn-out, painful, you-don't-want-to-die kind of death like getting hit by a car, but they're still not dead. A crow comes out of nowhere, is pecking their eye. Ah, ah, ah. And, you know, I'm just sitting there like, yep, I never want to know what the mark of the beast is or who the Antichrist is. And here my cousin is in my house telling me, I know what the mark of the beast is. Do you want to know what the mark of the beast is? And my brother and I are looking at each other like, we are going to die today. That's what we're thinking. Life is over. No cell phone in those days, no way to get in touch with mom and dad. Life is over. We're about to die. <clears throat> and like, I remember, I, you know, in my head, I was like trying to say no, but my mouth said yes. <laughs> I was like, how did that, how did that happen? <laughs> and then, so my cousin proceeds to tell me, she's like, okay, 
So there are certain companies that produce soap. <laughs> and on their soap boxes, they have a symbol. It's a circle with a half moon and a man's face in it. That is the mark of the beast. <laughs> and my brother and I are like, oh, we're about to die. We're about to die. <laughs> and then my cousin is like, do you have a soapbox in your house? And I'm like, yes, Susan. And she's like, where? And I'm like, it's in the basement. <laughs> she's like, let's go. And so... Off we go down the creaky steps. And in the background, I hear the horror music. And I'm like, we're about to die. We're about to die. We're about to die. So we get down to the basement. And then I point out the soapbox. And then me and my brother start backing up. And she goes to the soapbox. She picks it up. She turns it. And then she looks. And then she looks back at us. And she's like, there it is. <laughs> so my brother and I, we step up. We see the circle with the half moon and the man's face in it. We jump in the air, turn, run out of the house in our pajamas, screaming and crying. We're standing in the middle of the street looking for buildings to fall, trucks, crows, whatever. Because we're like, we're not, he's not getting us. He's not getting us. And like, we're crying and my cousin is dying of laughter. She's just dying of laughter. So... That was my introduction to the Bible. <laughs> um, that same year, Halloween time, we're getting ready to go trick-or-treating. This is my second int introduction to the Bible. We're getting ready to go trick-or-treating. My father pulls up around the corner, and he tells my brother and I, get in the car. And we're with our friends. We're like, well, Dad, it's Halloween, so we're going to go trick-or-treating. And then my dad says to us, you're not going trick-or-treating because Halloween is a devil's holiday. So, now mind you, I've never heard my father use the word God or the devil. So now I'm like, Dad, is everything okay? And he's like, get in the car. So my brother and I get in the car, and we're like, where are we going, Dad? Because we drove by my house. And he's like, you're going to church. Dad, please. <laughs> Wait, can we talk about this? You're going to church. So apparently what happened is that my aunt, who is also a Christian, told my father, she's Pentecostal, told my father, don't let your kids celebrate, celebrate Halloween. It's a devil's holiday. Bring them to church. So my father takes us to church and drops us off. <laughs> my brother and I are like, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> So we walk into the church. And they're showing this movie called The Cross and the Switchblade. And I remember as I'm watching this movie, I'm thinking to myself, whoa, God, this, this Jesus person can change criminals into like, you know, gang members into good people. I remember thinking that. And I remember thinking as a, as a child, I'm thinking, hey, you know what? I think I'd like to get to know Jesus one day. And as soon as the movie was over, <coughs> it's like <coughs> that thought kind of like left my mind. And I never thought about it again. God was planting seeds. That same year, I have an uncle who, who taught my brother and I um, martial arts. So we used to be big into martial arts. My uncle trained under, well, I'll tell you about that a little bit later. So he was our favorite uncle. Uh, taught us in martial arts and everything. And one day, I remember we were talking. We would talk about a lot of different things, but most, I mean, mostly martial arts. So one day we're talking. And my uncle's like, you know what? I just learned that the seventh day is a Sabbath. And I kind of looked at my uncle like, hmm, why are you telling me this? <laughs> it was just like, wow, peanut butter and jelly sandwich eating, and Saturday is a Sabbath. And I was like, so really? And he's like, yeah, and I think I'm going to start keeping it. And I was like, huh? That was, a con that was it. <laughs> that was a conversation. That was it. I didn't remember that conversation for years. That was it. Life as usual. <laughs> um, I, got, I get to the ninth grade, and in the ninth grade, um, you know, I discovered that I could change my name. 
So people would make fun of Ivor all the time. Ivor. So by ninth grade, you know, now I'm, I'm like, ninth grade, changing my name. Get to ninth grade, high school. Hey, yo, yo, what's your name? My name? Yeah. Passion. <laughs> so in ninth grade, I became passion. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so now, you know, I'm, you know, going deeper and deeper into, you know, just, you know, hit music and my brother and I, you know, break dance and all this stuff. And then in the 10th grade, my parents decided to move from, uh, from New York to a place called Fredericksburg, Virginia. And, uh, you know, growing up as, you know, young black men and moving to a place that ended in Berg was a very scary thing for us. <laughs> we're like, man, don't they lynch people in places that end with Berg? You know, so we were just like, oh, man, we're about to... We ended up going from an all-black school to being the only black people in an all-white school. <clears throat> and we were so the only black people in this all-white school that on the first day of, the, of school, the principal came up to us and said, can I help you? <laughs> and we were like, <clears throat> um, we're, we're students here. Oh, oh, welcome, welcome. <laughs> and, <clears throat> you know, we thought it was going to be like this big racial thing, but in actuality, the kids like, you know, everybody was like, you're from New York? We, yeah, we're from New York. <laughs> Sup? And they thought we were stars just because we were from New York. So we rode that. We were like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So at the same time, there was another, another guy that had just moved from Brooklyn, New York. His name was Little Sean. We call him Sean. My brother's name is Sean. His name is Sean. So, and he's short, so we called him Little Sean. Little Sean was in the hip hop just like us. We immediately hit it off, became best friends. And we started entering talent shows. And in every talent show we entered, we ended up coming in first place. And people started to tell us in high school, you guys are going to be famous. You're going to make it big. And, you know, we wanted to, like, actually be famous and make it big before we graduated from high school so that we wouldn't have to go to college. We could just be rich. And uh, that didn't happen, so off we went to college. So when I got to college now, I went to a place called Virginia State University. And uh, my brother went to Virginia Union. Little Sean went to Virginia State with me. And so when I get to college now, <clears throat> I change my name. Because, you know, passion was so high school. It's high school, man. It's high school. So it's 1990, and in the hip-hop era now, it's all about, you know, the, the dashiki. And, you know, the, if any of you were ever, the dashikis and the color beads. And, you know, it's all about, you know, the black man, the black man. So when I get to Virginia State University, and, you know, nobody knows me, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know. And they're like, hey, what's up, what's up man? What's your name? My name? Yeah, what's your name, man? My name? Africa. Call me Africa. So now I'm Africa, right, on campus, you know, all black college. You say, Africa. Yo, that's Africa. Yo, you know what that is? That's Africa. <laughs> right? So, so now I'm Africa. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> and um, I have a group of friends. We all kind of like clicked. It was, you know, probably anywhere between like, I don't know, 30 or 40 of us. <clears throat> and we had a name for our crew. We, you know, we had a crew and the name of our crew was uh, the X-Men. <clears throat> Comic book, X-Men. So we would just like do nothing but like hang out, drink, smoke, party, get into fights. That's what we did in college. Um, Friday night, go to a club. And I was usually the one getting us into fights. Um, and, you know, the battle cry was X-Men. So if one of us got into a fight, they'd just be like, yo, X-Men! And then that would just be the battle cry, X-Men! You say X-Men! And then shh, off we go, right? Fighting. Yes. 
Yeah, I know you're looking like, no, Pastor, not you. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and we would get in the fights over all kinds of things. I remember, uh, and, and you know what? God, I'm telling you, God was merciful in, in this time in my life. Because you're 19, you know, 18, and you think you're on top of the world. You, you got it all under control. I remember one time I was in the cafeteria, and this football player comes up to me, issue over a girl, and he's like, Yo, you, you know, trying to like, you know, whatever to me. Yo, man, man. And, you know, he's a football player. He's like this, right? And, you know, I'm like, you know, at that time, 18 years old. I'm not very big. You know, I'm tall, my height, not, not very big, but my uncle taught me the martial arts. <laughs> my uncle trained under William Chung, who was the classmate of Bruce Lee, who were both trained under Yip Man. So I don't care how big you are, man. <laughs> <laughs> so he's doing this thing, and I'm like, whatever, man. So, you know, we kind of go our separate ways, and I'm sitting down with, with, with my friend. It was, it was actually little Sean, and he was like, what happened? And I was like, this guy, man, whatever. There. And then as I'm speaking, I hear this commotion behind me, and I turn around, and the guy is like full speed coming at my neck in the cafeteria to Africa. <laughs> so I jump out my seat and I'm like, no, he didn't. And I get in my Bruce Lee stance like, what? <laughs> when I notice that like the entire football team is behind him and they're all coming at me. And I'm like, all right, Bruce Lee takes out 20 people at a time, not a problem. <laughs> and then I'm like, well, maybe not today. <laughs> And I start, I don't run, <clears throat> you know, because I'm Africa. So I start backing up coolly in my Bruce Lee stance, like just trying to survey the situation, you know. <clears throat> and I get to this wall and I cannot back up any further. And the entire team jumps on me and they start throwing blows. Not me, them. <clears throat> I'm at the bottom of this rubble. And I'm literally like, I wonder what's going on up there because nobody's touching me. I feel myself begin to move. I'm right in the center of this pile of people throwing punches at me. I feel myself begin to move. There's a cafeteria door right here. The cafeteria door opens. I get put outside the cafeteria door. The door shuts, and there's pandemonium going on inside. <laughs> Little do I know enough about angels to know that my life was just spared. No, no, no. What do I do? I go to the payphone and I call up the X-Men. <laughs> and I'm like, we got beef. <laughs> <clears throat> I will leave that story right there. <laughs> oh, it's, yeah. So that was, that was how we lived life. Um, when I was actually that year, uh, I got a call from my cousin Susan. She was back in the States. <laughs> she calls me up at like 11 o'clock at night and she's like hey I'm here in the states and I'm like Susan what's up and you know I mean we're just greeting she's like listen you need to you and Sean need to come see me in New York and we're like cool when and she's like tonight and I'm like Susan it's 11 p.m. at night she's like no 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 no. I need to Susan it's a five-hour drive no I need to see you and Sean tonight. I'm like, all right, Susan, we'll be there. So my brother and I get in the car, and I pick him up at Virginia Union University. We get in the car, and off we go up I-95, headed to New York from Virginia. And uh, all I remember is waking up. If you're driving and all you remember is waking up, that's not a good thing. <laughs> all I remember is waking up, and, and I remember waking up, and the first thing I did was like I kind of like looked, to my side, and there my brother was. He was sleeping, as he usually does. And I was kind of groggy, and I turned back in front of me and looked at the speedometer. It said like 65 or 70. I noticed that my hand was on the steering wheel. I looked to the side of me. The highway was there. I looked in front of me, and I saw nothing, just darkness and branches. And then I was like, huh, I think I'm driving on the shoulder of the road. That's strange. <laughs> Didn't step on the brake. You know, I'm 19 years old, okay? So 
that's strange. Then he said, I'm on the brake, stirred the car right back up on it, and just kept going. <laughs> Whatever. <clears throat> no biggie. <clears throat> I get to New York about four, five o'clock in the morning, and my brother and I greet Susan. We're like, hey, well, you know. Then we're like, so Susan, like, what happened that you need us to come? And she's like, God wanted me to tell you. And I remember when she said the word God, I was like, no, she did not make me drive. <laughs> five, no, she didn't. <laughs> No, she didn't. No, she didn't. <laughs> she did not just do this. <laughs> she says, God told me that you and your brother need to be baptized. Amen. And for a moment, we were quiet. And then, like, suddenly in my mind, I began to think, wait a minute. Like, I don't know why this thought came, but it was just like, wait a minute. If God is real, he would have known that you were going to tell us this. And I, if he would have known that you were going to tell us this, then might Satan have known this too? Why did we fall asleep on the road? And who kept my hand on the steering wheel to keep me from crashing so that I could get here? And I remember my brother and I, it's like we got goosebumps like at the same time. We were like, whoa. Did God just like save our lives to hear what you had to tell us? My brother and I were so convicted that we went back to Virginia. We went back to Virginia. And when we got back, we started driving around to find a church to be baptized in. When I, when I mean driving around to find a church, I mean driving around and seeing a building and going, that looks like a church. <laughs> we would get out the car, go knock on the church door. Can we be baptized here? Well, we have to study. No, 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 no. We would leave, <laughs> get in the car, drive to another. We didn't know that there were denominations. So we were just like, look, that looks like a church. Let's go. And we would go, knock, and we were going church to church. And finally, there was, there was a church that said, we'll baptize you and we'll, we'll do it next week. We were like, good. You see, I had, when I would be in the clubs and, you know, go, you know, be, be fighting, I remember at night I would lay on my bed and think, man, what would have happened if I died tonight? Like I would, you know, by day, Africa. By night, man, what would have happened if I died tonight? <laughs> so when I got baptized, it was like, yes. Now if I die while I'm fighting in the clubs, Everything's going to be all right. <laughs> One night, a friend of mine called me up. Africa, you got to come hear this song. I was in the house music. I don't know if any of you know what house music is. Very heavy, hypnotic dance rhythm. We were big in the house music, house dancers. And uh, he called me up and was like, you got to come hear this song. So I go over to his house and I'm listening to this song. And um, heavy beat, and this voice comes on, but it's a voice of the devil. You hear it, it's, it's, you've been manipulated to sound like a demon voice, but these were the words. And I opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And I'm like, hey, is, that sounds like it would be from the Bible. And he was like, yeah, that, that's, I think that's from the Bible. And for some reason, I got this idea in my mind. And I was like, all right, all right, man, later. I go back, I call up all of X-Men, and I'm like, hey, I got an idea. And they're like, what? I was like, why don't we read through the entire book of Revelation tonight? <laughs> they were like, all right. <laughs> I don't even know where we got a Bible from. I, pro I don't know where we got... We got a Bible, got our marijuana, and we would, we would read, pass the marijuana, pass the Bible, and I must tell you that we were blown away. 
we were, <laughs> we were just like, what? <laughs> After a couple of hours, we read through the entire book of Revelation, and we were like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to start putting lyrics from the book of Revelation into our music. That's going to be our new thing. Yes. <laughs> no idea what we were talking about, but yes. <laughs> so now we enter this talent show uh, in Howard, at Howard uh, University in Washington, D.C. 40 contestants. Out of 40 contestants, we went first, came in first place. There were some scouts there who said, hey, you guys shop, a, do a demo, get us a demo. We'll take it to New York and we'll see what we can do. We created the demo, and I, if I remember correctly, it was in like within six days that we, were, we got a major recording uh, contract with EMI Records, based in New York, uh, for eight albums, just under $1 million. We were like, all right, we are set. It is time to... So, we, the, our four-man group, we had added one more guy once we got to college. Our four-man group l dropped out of college, and off we went to New York City, and many of the X-Men dropped out with us. Because when we got our record deal, we were going to get them record deals. So I want you to imagine now, like, you know, 20, 30, dreadlock. By the way, I changed my name one more time. <laughs> I was no longer Africa. Now... What's your name, man? Yoda. <laughs> Long red dreadlocks. Long red beard, my cane. What's up? Yoda. My brother's name, Jedi. Yeah. Name of our group, Boogie Monsters. <clears throat> we were very eclectic. <laughs> Our music was, was like, <clears throat> it wasn't like gangster. It was very, you know, like abstract. You're probably like, huh, okay, okay. So off we go to New York City. And um, now we're like, yeah, we've made it. You know, my parents didn't want us to drop out of school, but we dropped out of school. Um, they, we told them, Mom, Dad, this is like a million-dollar contract. And they were like, you have one semester. If it doesn't work, you're going back to school. We're like, okay, yes. Off we went. We're like, we're not going back to school. We get to New York City, and we're now living the life. Yep, partying, hanging out with the people that we would watch on TV. We are now rubbing shoulders with these stars that we had one time only been able to look up to and watch on TV. And it is here that we met a young man, let me say it this way. It is here that God said, let there be light. Because we met a young man who we did not know was a Seventh-day Adventist. He was hanging out. He was a friend of a friend of ours. So at, my house, at our house, we would have parties like, you know, just party out. People would be coming to our house, hanging out just all hours of the night. We'd be stepping over people that we don't even know and, you know, just living the life. And one night, a friend of ours brought a friend of his to our house. He's dreadlocked just like us, you know, just like one of us. And so we're all there this night and the first time he's at the house and we're talking, right? And we are... We're talking about the New World Order and how they're after the black man. <laughs> so we're talking, yeah, man, I'm telling you, man, the New World Order. And you know, I'm telling you, watch out for those soapboxes, man, because I'm telling you, <laughs> I'm telling you, man, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna cut, <laughs> cut, 
cut those. <laughs> They're going to put those marks on us, man, and we don't want that. We got to rhyme about this. And the friend of a friend of ours, he looks at us as we're talking, and he's like, so what day do you guys think the Sabbath is? And I remember thinking to myself, like, remember now, no remembrance of the discussion at the age of 12. I remember thinking to myself, okay, here we are having an important discussion about real biblical things, and your friend here wants to know what day the Sabbath is. (laughs) Sunday. Everybody knows that. And we kind of like high-fived each other, you know, kind of like, anyway, man, back to serious conversation. (laughs) Soapboxes, man, I'm telling you, man, the mark of the beast. Watch out for those circles, yo, I'm telling you. So he's standing there, and he's like, think again. So he, we were like, think again? What, what, what is your friend talking about, man? He's like, what's the first day of the week? And we were like, Sunday? <laughs> then he says, what's the seventh day of the week? And we were like, Sunday? <laughs> One, two, three. One, two, three, four. We're like, wait a minute. And then this guy, from memory, begins to break down to us. Daniel 7, lion, bear, leopard, dragon, ten horns, little horn, thinking to change times and laws. And we are, we are sitting there. It must have been three to four hours, having never heard anything like this before. And we're just like, what did you just say? The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. We had never, I had never heard any, I was a skeptic of all religion. I was like, yes, all made up. You're, you are whatever you are because you were born there. Muslim because you were born in a Muslim country. Christian because, so I'm not, you know, this stuff, not really. When he broke this down and I remembered the history from secular school, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome. From that night on, you came into that house you would find 20 to 30 of us, two, three, four o'clock in the morning, reading the Bible with our marijuana (laughs) because God was working on us (laughs) in stages. (laughs) We were, we we were like, wait a minute, who? So we finally were like, man, what are you? And he's like, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. A what? What is that? (laughs) Then we're like, all right, we're going to church with you this Saturday. So I want you to imagine. (laughs) Like 20 dreadlocked, pants sagging, gum chewing, cane carrying, (laughs) 20 of us, walking up into this small church in Laurelton, Queens. And you should have seen the looks on the people's faces. (laughs) We get into the church and we sit down And we're like this. And the minister begins to speak. Beloved, remember that the seventh day is the Sabbath. What? Did you hear that? (laughs) Friends, remember to pay your tithe. Tithe? Oh, that 
was deep. Did you hear Malachi 3? Where is Malachi 3? Malachi, wow, that was deep. I have never heard anything like that before. Tithe, we've got to warn the world. <laughs> Everything the minister said, we lost our minds. We were like, no, we were like, all right, I'm done. I'm done. Jesus is God. I'm done. I am done. <laughs> and I was, I was no. But then we got confused because everybody else was sitting there like this. And so we were like, wait, 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 wait. They must not have just heard that the minister said <laughs> that Jesus loves you. They must not have heard that because they're being too quiet. They're being too, no, 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 no. <sighs> that was 20 years ago. Nothing's changed. <laughs> nothing's, nothing's changed. No? No? <laughs> you guys, <laughs> there is something about growing up with truth where it becomes so familiar to you that you lose the fire. And it doesn't have to be like that. It doesn't. It, 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 God has not set up a system where people who come from outside the church are naturally just more excited than people who are raised. You can be excited being raised up in the church. You can have an experience being raised up in the church. But I'm just telling you, for me, it was like, okay, why aren't, why aren't they screaming? <laughs> Why aren't they losing their minds right now at what he just said? Because I, I have never heard anything like this. So what's going on? Are they alive? <laughs> Let me tell you, we were so, because we didn't know that, that Seventh-day Adventist was a church. So we just thought that this guy, our friend, was just like, like maybe he was a prophet or maybe he was actually like Jesus himself because we were just like, man, nobody knows a Bible like this guy. He must be the Messiah and we are his disciples. Don't touch him. <laughs> Don't touch him and see what happens. Because <laughs> we just didn't know, you know. We were just like, who knows a Bible like this guy? Nobody. Nobody. Then we were like, oh, he's part of a movement. The Adventist. So, I mean, we were just like, all right, man. I mean, and, and let me tell you, when, when, oh, man. So we were just so blown away. We were like, all right, we're about to take the three angels' messages and we're about to put it in our hip-hop music. <laughs> so now, now, you know, we're studying just by ourselves. <clears throat> we're not studying. We were, there happened to be an Adventist bookstore right down the street from us, right down the street from us. My second home became that Adventist bookstore. Because I was like, what else? What else? What? And I began get, So now we're like, all right, all right. So we know what we're going to do now. We're going to be the hip-hop messengers of the world. <laughs> so we're in the clubs, right? And we're performing on Friday night. You, you missed that. <laughs> and uh, we're in the club. Clubs and... <clears throat> We would perform with backpacks on. So, you know, we'd be performing. And then in the middle of our performance, we'd stop and we'd ask this question. Who wants to know who the man of sin is? Throw your hands in the air. And everybody would throw their hands in the air. Everybody. So we'd open up our backpacks and we would take out the great controversy book and start throwing it out into the audience. And people were like, give me my book. I mean, they were fighting over the... That's mine, man. I mean, you should have seen... You should have seen people in the clubs fighting. 
over the great controversy. Don't you wish? <laughs> Don't you just wish? <laughs> Fighting. That's mine. <laughs> you know, with an alcohol bottle in one hand and a, give me that. <laughs> So the Bible says in times of ignorance, God winks. And, and I, God must have been up in heaven like... <laughs> Angels, just, just go attend to them. They, they don't know what they're doing. Go. Just bless them. Just, just keep them. Just keep them. In times of ignorance... God winks. God winks. So um, we end, oh, so sometimes, like, we would have girls that would, you know, you know how it is in the music industry and, you know, girls, you know? You know, yeah. And, and so sometimes, you know, after the performance, you know, hey, can we come back to the room with you? You want to come back to the room with us? Yeah. All right. Yeah, you can come back to the room with us. <laughs> so, go to the, to the room. So, I apologize. Just follow me. Go, go to the room. Then uh, we get inside the room. Lock the door. Bam! Open your Bibles. All right. All right. All right. No, 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 no. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. All right. Daniel chapter 2. Mm -hmm. Got all night. Daniel 2 begins with a head of gold. <laughs> and, you know, so we were just like, <laughs> I'm telling you, we were gung-ho. <laughs> we were gung-ho. Um, and what ended up happening is that uh, almost all of us ended up getting baptized into the Adventist church. And... Yeah. So we were like, yes, it is, it is, this is it. This is it. Because let me tell you, I mean, I was scared when I started studying Adventism because it made so much sense. And, and I was just like, you know, religion doesn't really, I mean, I get it, but it doesn't really make sense. This, I was like, there was no way for me to escape it. No way for me to escape it. And so, so we get, we get baptized, and let me tell you, God has a sense of humor. You know, on day two, the Bible says God drew the waters out, I mean, separated the waters from the waters. Yeah, it's almost as though God began to say to me, God began to lead me to a place where he was going to draw me out of what I had been involved in. God has a sense of humor because um, I was baptized in a church in Brooklyn, New York, Kingsborough Seventh-day Adventist Church. It was an all-black church. The church that I originally started going to was in Laurelton, an all-black church. So I thought that Adventism was a black movement. <laughs> so I remember when I met one of my first white Adventists, I was like, yes, baby, the gospel's going into all the world, yes. I was like, you know this movement is powerful when a white man joins a black movement. You know. <laughs> what? <laughs> and I'm sure that white Adventist was looking at me like, what is the matter with you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, man, you know what? Wow. Um, I don't even know what time it is. I don't even know how long I've been talking. I haven't even finished my testimony. It must be this hat. <laughs> it must be this hat. Um, uh, Ten minutes left? Wow. That is crazy. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> the children. The children. We'll do it for the children. Um, wow. Uh, now I, I'm going to spend ten minutes trying to think about what I need to share. <laughs> No. Um, okay. So just let me know. Just, okay. Um, so uh, where would I leave off at? Yes, yes. White Adventist. Black movement. Yes. So um, 
uh, one day we get a, a uh, fan letter from someone who says, hey, I appreciate what you guys are doing. Um, you know, you're talking about God and everything in your music, but the Bible says light and darkness cannot dwell together. How can you have a name like Boogie Monsters when you claim to be serving God? And we laughed at the letter. We all looked at the letter and like, this guy. The next day we were, we were in our um, office talking with our managers. Yeah, man, so we need to change the name of our group. <laughs> and they were like, no, you, you, people already know you by that name. We're not changing the name of your group. And I remember at that moment is when I realized, I was like, okay, like Babylon will, Babylon will only allow you, the world, let me say it that way, the world will only allow you to go so far when you really want to stand for Jesus. I remember that moment I began thinking, this isn't going to last long. This isn't going to last long. I remember getting frustrated because I'd be in the clubs and, you know, we'd be doing the great controversy thing and, <laughs> and uh, <coughs> we'd be like, you know, I mean, literally we'd be like, you know, get out of the clubs. <laughs> get out of the clubs, you know, I mean, you know, if God came tonight and you were in the club, what would happen? I mean, you know, it's the Sabbath. And... <laughs> And uh, I was like, God, like, why are these people dancing to our warnings? <laughs> you know, we're trying to tell them Babylon has fallen and, and they're dancing to our stuff. And, and, and they, I remember God saying to me, you cannot call people out of Babylon if you are still in Babylon yourself. God drew me. I remember that helped me to make this decision. My brother and I decided we were going to leave the music industry because we felt that we could not combine light and darkness. We had to make a statement. And my brother and I both decided to leave. God drew us out of the waters, day two. Are you with me? The Bible says on day three, God brought forth fruit. God began to change my brother and I. I used to curse, like, just curse, curse, curse. I remember one day my brother was like, you know, he calls me Al. That was, that's my middle name. He was like, Al, I think <clears throat> that if we want to be saved, we probably should stop cursing. And I was like, you know, younger brothers, come on, Sean. Who then shall be saved? That's how much we cursed. <clears throat> it was just cursing was just like, but you know what happened? Like the more that, that we, the more that we were studying is God just began to take these things away from us. All of a sudden, the, the, the cursing was gone. God like changed us. He began to, new fruit began to be born in our lives. Um, my pants came up <laughs> to my waistline. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I like to say this way that God, God actually, I believe, healed me because I used to walk like this. <laughs> There's something wrong with my leg. And <laughs> when, <laughs> when I gave my life to the Lord, <laughs> it's... I can walk straight again. <laughs> I can walk normal. <laughs> it, it just went away. <laughs> it went away. God, God changed us, changed my language. He, he, he cut, I cut everything off. I ended up going to work at Target, making $5.50 an hour from a million-dollar contract. My brother was working for the for the government, holding stop signs, road construction, so people would see him on the road, like, hey, isn't that Jedi? Jedi, what are you doing? <laughs> what? <laughs> and, you know, people would come in the Target, see me, y Yoda? <laughs> and, you know, we would proudly say, yeah, we gave it up for the Lord. <clears throat> no shame, no shame, no shame. Day four, the Bible says that God creates the lesser light and the, the greater light and the lesser light. God brought a new light into my life. 
uh, the greater light, the Word of God, the lesser light, the spirit of prophecy. <laughs> and let me tell you, when I started reading the spirit of prophecy, to me, it was a no-brainer. It was like, yep, prophet. <laughs> yeah, that was it. That was it. I began to study the Bible, the greater light. I began to study the word of God like nothing. I would spend hours and hours and hours studying now. So a little bit of background uh, that you may now understand. See, when I began studying the Bible, I had no one to, you know, like say, okay, this is how you study the Bible. So I had just this clean plate of like nothingness and God just, I believe, spoke to me in my language. As a hip-hop artist, you were always trying to find a new way. You didn't want to say something that someone else said. It was called biting. That, you know, don't bite. Yeah. So we just grew up on that. Don't take someone else's stuff and say the same thing the same way they said it. So we would write our lyrics, and we would have to write it in such a way <clears throat> that we might be saying the same thing, but saying it in a totally unique way. And so when I began to, when I opened the Bible, it wasn't like I was trying to say, okay, I want to th see things. It was just, that was just how my mind operated. <clears throat> and so God would just show me things and I'd be like, huh, that's an interesting way to look at the Sabbath. Huh, that's a different way to look at this particular text. And that's how God just began to work with me. And, and I didn't know that he was training me to actually do what I'm doing now. I had no idea. It was just like, wow, look at this, isn't it? And I would share with people, and they'd be like, okay, well, how did you just get that? Uh, because that's what it says. <laughs> what? Did I do something just now? <laughs> um, and so God began to just, I was eating this word day and night. And let me tell you, one of the reasons why is because my parents, after my brother and I got baptized, my parents thought that my brother and I were crazy. They were like, we didn't want you to drop out of school. You did. You got this record deal. You started appearing on MTV, Soul Train, Rap City. Now we're happy for you. And now you're telling us that you're dropping out of this because of God? You guys are crazy. We're going to pray for you. <laughs> My parents who didn't go to church began praying for us. <laughs> they began to try to argue with us as to why what we believe was very stupid, foolish, and we were part of a cult. And for three years, they tried to convince us that we were crazy. And after those three years, they gave up and got baptized. <laughs> Which leads me to day five. God creates the fish of the sea. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of men. And you know what? Like, when I gave my life to the Lord, and I'm studying and I'm praying and I'm like, all right, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> God began to do some, like I didn't know that God was going to call me into ministry because remember my greatest fear was speaking in front of people. As a hip hop artist, you could hide behind the music. You could hide behind a facade. You could be Yoda. You could be Africa. Totally say, all right, man, be Yoda now, be Yoda now. <laughs> to just stand up and speak, it was like, no, 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 that's not me. But that's exactly what God put on my heart. God put a fire in my heart that I could not contain it. In fact, my life in the past was so messed up. I, I was like, I remember telling people, I remember, I, have, I don't think I've ever shared this. I may have shared this before. I don't know. I don't think I have. I'm going to share two stories I've, I don't think I've ever shared before. My first testimony that I ever gave they opened the, the, you know, the floor for testimonies. And I remember it was at, an, at, at uh, one of the churches in New York. And I remember I came up to the platform and I began to speak about being introduced to Seventh-day Adventism. And then I began to cry because there's what I said. God, Satan knew that if I gave my life to God, that I would, that I would want to, be, to preach but he messed my life up before, and because my life is messed up before, I cannot be a minister, and it breaks my heart. And I just started crying. Because, you know, I had done things in my past that I was like, yeah, well, you know, ministers need to be perfect. So, so I, when I got down, 
they, people started coming to me, you know, brother, if God calls you to the ministry, you can be a minister. And I was like, how dare you? <laughs> Did you not just hear my testimony up there? Did you not just hear what I said about my past life? How dare you? And I was like, mm-mm. But there was something here that was burning that I could not let go. I remember going and talking to a pastor, Pastor Abraham Jules. Some of you may know him, Pastor Abraham Jules. I said, Pastor, I think that I want to preach. And he was like, is there anything else you could see yourself doing? And I was like, no. And he was like, if there's anything you can see yourself doing, do it. If there's nothing else you can see yourself doing, God's called you to ministry. And I was like, I think God's called me to ministry. And I left his office saying, yeah, but my life is too messed up, so I'm not doing it. Months later, I'm at a retreat, and another minister is there speaking, and I couldn't get this off my heart. I went to go speak to this minister, and I'm beginning to tell him all the reasons why I think that God wants me to speak, but all the reasons why I can't. And he's sitting there looking at me. And I'll never forget, he said these words to me. What doest thou here, Elijah? (laughs) And I was like, (laughs) (laughs) and that was it. I was like, okay, okay. And that's what sent me into ministry. That's when I was like, all right. I couldn't get rid of the fire. I couldn't get rid of the fire. Man, you know I feel bad right now because I just got caught up in my testimony. And don't put this out on Facebook, okay? Because I just totally forgot to tie in the whole Avenger of Blood theme (laughs) because you guys just been making me all... I'm just like, wait a minute. Oh, man. (laughs) Oh, boy. (laughs) Jael, I'm going to tie it in. I, I, I'll, I'll wrap it up and tie it in. But let me say this. Day six. Day six. Day five. Day five still. <clears throat> I go out to speak. My, my aunts and nieces and nephews would sometimes come to hear me, you know, especially my older, you know, cousins, aunts. Oh, you know, Al is coming to preach. We should go hear him. And I'd be like, yes, I'm coming to preach. Come here, little Al. <laughs> they come to the meeting. I preach. A couple weeks later, they're baptized. God began to use my brother and I to reach our family, my father, my mother, my brother, my brother's wife. God began to use us to become fishers of men. Day six, the Bible said God made man in his image. I believe that the process of recreation, God was recreating me in his image. And he also gave me my bride, Atante, and he completed the testimony. One thing left, day seven. God wants to seal us in his image. And that's what I'm, we all need to be in day seven when Jesus returns. What day are you in? That's the question, right? What day are you in? So look, let me do this. (coughs) Can I finish this Jael theme? I got to finish this, and then I'm, then I'm closing my Bible, see? So I'm going to just do this from memory. Listen, that was my run to the city. That was my run to the city. And I remember getting to the city and being so excited. Lord, wow, this is the city. Look at, listen, <clears throat> I had learned so much about Adventism in like three months that when I would see a gray-haired Adventist, I would almost want to be like John and bow down and worship. Because I'd be like, if I've been in this for three months and you look like you've been in this for years, <laughs> what must you know? <laughs> I was <just> like, man. <coughs> <coughs> and then they were like, could you explain that to me again? And I'd be like, wait, what? <laughs> me? Yeah, I was just like, man, Adventists are the deepest people on every last one of them. Boom. 
I remember getting to the city and I remember, I'm speaking symbolically now, looking upon the walls and seeing some young people at the walls looking outside the city. And I was like, Lord, well, who are those? And why are they looking outside the city? And it's like the Lord said to me, those are young people who want to go where you just came from. Wait, no, that couldn't be possible. <laughs> this, these are Adventists. <laughs> this, this is us. This is a remnant. That can't be possible. Yeah. Yeah. See, many of us are like playing freeze tag with the devil. Soon as Friday sundown, Saturday sundown hits, we're off out into the world, hoping not, not to get caught by the avenger of blood. We get back right in time for Friday sundown, get in church on Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. <laughs> and we keep playing that game until one Sabbath we're missing, then the next Sabbath, then the next Sabbath. Where are they? Oh, they got caught outside the city. They're frozen outside the city. <clears throat> Remember how we talked about the avenger of blood? How he was the nearest of kin? There's something that I want to tell you about the avenger of blood. You see, I want you to imagine that you've been running for your life from the avenger of blood, and then you get to the city. And by the grace of God, you, make, you plead guilty and God says, I declare you innocent. And then you start to talk to God. God, you know what? Man, that, that run was like kind of the craziest thing because the avenger of blood was on my trail. And it was kind of weird because I know there were times that I got tired. And I felt like I was definitely going to get caught outside the city. But it would seem like when I slowed down, the avenger slowed down. And then God says to you, I want to tell you something, son, daughter. And you're like, what? He's like, you know, the avenger of blood. Who, who is that? And you say, well, it's the nearest of kin. And he's like, right. So who are you guilty of killing? And you're like, Jesus. Wait a minute. God, are you, are you trying to tell me that you were the one that was chasing me? Oh, wow. Amen. Amen. Who is the nearest of kin to Jesus? <clears throat> His father. Wait a minute. God, you are the... See, beloved, listen. Do you realize how slow God has to run <laughs> to not catch you? <laughs> God is like, I was trying to... Listen, I need you to know, I need you to know that I was only trying to chase you into the city because you wouldn't have gone any other way. <laughs> I couldn't see your face. That's right, you couldn't see my face. You didn't know it was me, but yes, I am the avenger of blood. The Bible actually tells us that God, you know in Isaiah 54, the Bible says, in a little wrath I hid my face from you, but with everlasting kindness will I draw you to myself, save the Lord thy redeemer. That word redeemer is the Hebrew word gael, nearest of kin. It is true. Whom the Lord loves, he chases. Whom the Lord loves, he chases. Amen. <laughs> God chasing you into the city. Why? 
Why? Because he loves us. <clears throat> Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Did the Lord love the Egyptians? Yeah, he did. How do we know that? Because he chastened them. Do you realize that the plagues poured out upon Egypt were God's design to save Egypt? <clears throat> when he poured out, when he made the water blood, let me ask you something. If we're here in Australia, we're at, at campground and we all go back to our places and, you know, if we're, you turn on the water and blood comes out. How many of you would say, huh, that's strange. <laughs> you probably wouldn't. <laughs> You'd be like, I'm out of here. <laughs> that's it. Plain and simple. <clears throat> when God is pouring out these plagues upon Egypt, he is wanting the Egyptians to desire something better. God will pour plagues out upon the things that you love in a hope to desire you, to want you, to, to get you to want something better. He will turn the club scene into a very disgusting place to you. The place you once used to love, and suddenly you're like, oh, man, this, what? You begin to see shapes of demons in the clubs, and you're like, I need to get out of here. That's what God will do. That's what he did with the Egyptians. How do we know God loved the Egyptians? Because guess what? Guess who left Egypt? It was not just the Israelites. It was a mixed multitude. There were Egyptians who said, I want something better. And the plagues had done their appointed work in leading some Egyptians to say, I'm out. I don't want any of this. So, beloved, that's what God does with those whom he loves. He says, listen, that boyfriend you were with, all right, we're going to make that relationship go really bad. <laughs> that girlfriend, that job, we're going to make that go sour. Why? Because if I don't take that from you, you're going to lose your eternal salvation. Whom the Lord loves, he chases. You think God is chasing you, trying to kill you, when he's chasing you, trying to save your life. So check it out. I'm closing now. I'm on the second step. <coughs> at the end of time, at the end of time, the righteous are in the city coming down out of New Jerusalem, <coughs> coming down out of heaven. The question is, how did they get there? God chased them there. God chased them into the city. Why did he chase them there? <coughs> he chased them there because he did not want to meet them outside the city. Because he knows that if he meets you outside the city, he has to avenge the blood of his son. Can you imagine that? God, his son, and the Holy Spirit are conspiring to save you. God is like, all right, I'll be the avenger of blood. Jesus says, okay, I'll be the way. The Holy Spirit says, all right, I'll bring conviction to make them start running. <laughs> they are plotting to save you. <laughs> They're like, all right, all right. No, this one is hard-headed, so let's see. Yeah, this, this is the plan. We got it. <laughs> plotting to save you. He doesn't want to meet you outside the city because he loves you. The only one he wants to meet outside the city is Satan and the angels. My appeal very simply tonight is stay in the city. If you're not in the city, get in the city. If you're not in the city, it's time to run now. Start running. Stop running away from God and start running to that city. Plead guilty, and I guarantee you, God will save you. God will save you. You guys have uh, been a blessing to me tonight. And, uh, wow. Oh, oh. I changed my name one more time. 
the name is once again Ivor. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I did not know this, but the name Ivor means archer. <laughs> so when I preach, I like to consider myself God's archer. Lord, help me to take your word and help it to pierce the hearts of your people. Amen. Archer. Oh, one more thing. <clears throat> I was studying one day and I saw that the letter X in the Greek alphabet stands for Christ. You know, like, you know, that's why they say Xmas for Christmas. And then I was like... God wants me to be an X-Man. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to us tonight. Lord, I pray that this testimony will have been a blessing to someone. I pray that someone who may be running from you, running away from the city, will turn around and run toward the city. We thank you, God, for, for being able to run in divine slow motion so that you won't catch us outside of the city. But, Lord, time is running out. Please, Lord, move upon your people to make it into the city. Help us, Lord, to be the signposts along the road to point others to the city. And we thank you, Lord, for your amazing grace. We thank you for making us new creations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>